Well, it's the, the this is the time of year where there's nothing going on, but it's also where you need some talent to create content in these moments of doldrums. And that's why Kyle and Mills and I are going to be entertaining you shockingly, surprisingly, with some interesting Warriors content next. Stay tuned to find out what that is. This is Locked On Warriors. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow Kylan Mills on all social media platforms, including Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Kylan Mills. You can follow me on threads at Dog Wild and on Twitter at Dog Surf Rocho. Kylan, how are you doing? Is it hot where you're at? It's a little warm here. How are you doing today? What? It's Thursday. good. How are you? Friday? Uh, it's, Friday. it's Friday. Warm, oh but it's not unpleasant. In the peninsula, it's pretty nice today. Uh, up and down for, from SF, uh, it starts getting hot once you get closer to San Jose. But overall, beautiful day. Sun is shining. Can't complain. Getting some dental work done. Not going to talk oh. about that. So looking forward to breaking down some interesting Warriors nuggets that have happened uh, in the last couple of days. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I, I'm so sorry you're going to the dentist. I, I do not. I do not. I am not a role model in that department. Um, I'm deathly afraid of my next visit. You recently went. You got to go in for for. Yeah. Sorry if I'm going doing TMI here, but good luck today because you're going oh, under uh, yeah. a little bit today. That's rough. That's rough. I don't know what I'll say about that. Um, you oh, know, the, the graphic next to us has uh, today's lineup. If you're watching this on YouTube, and it's all about Steph. But then Kylan and I, we always do a pre-show meeting, and the graphic was made before our meeting. And then during the meeting, we realized, oh yeah, there are a couple like like interesting sound bites we could play before we delve into a show dedicated to Stephen Curry. And look, we have a whole summer to do that. Um, and just just before I get into these other clips, I was asked to um, sort of narrate a documentary. I don't know if narrate's the right word. They ask you like a bunch of questions. You, you know, you're aware that this is for a documentary, and so you're just trying to answer so cool. being cognizant of the fact that these are documentary answers and not answers for like a podcast or typical interview and the documentary was about Stephen Curry and a lot of the questions were like going back to his rookie year like 2009 going back to all the years leading up to the first championship and it was just a lot of really interesting questions like one of the questions for example Kylan and I don't know if you could answer this so I'll, I'll throw this out at you like, how did you view Stephen Curry in 2013, like going into that season, Mark Jackson's first year? Like, did you see greatness at that point? Did you see Hall of Fame greatness at that point? Like, like what did you see in Stephen Curry in 2013? This was before the team started making the playoffs. Again, this was Mark Jackson's first year. Um, what did you think of Stephen Curry at that point in his career? Were you even following the NBA that closely? Yeah, I was following the NBA and and I knew about Steph Curry because of what he did at Davidson. So you can't remember the way that he led, you know, Davidson College, which was a I don't want to say total unknown before Steph Curry, but not, you know, any kind of powerhouse in basketball. And he led them on an incredible March Madness run, uh, you know, average one season. I think it was twenty eight and a half points per game for Davidson, uh, you know. So from watching college basketball, knew who he was, thought he was a special player. But honestly, I didn't know if his game was going to translate to the NBA because Steph is so undersized. He was very skinny at that point. So when he even initially joined the NBA, I had doubts about whether he'd be able to hang just because of the physicality and because of his size, which is crazy to think about now. Even though he was a great shooter and generally the finesse skills, you know, you can get away with being not as physical of a player, but still he's really small. Um, yep. So like for him and he was so skinny back then. That's the other thing. If you look at pictures of him in college, like he's put on a lot of weight, like he was a twig back, you know, in his collegiate days. So it's so fascinating to see. Um, I thought he was a special player in college. Wasn't sure if he was going to reach that same level of success at the NBA level right. going into 2013. He definitely was not on my radar for being uh, the greatest of all time. And, you know, be or 
being the future greatest of all time or that he even had that caliber of play in him. Um, so it's kind of crazy to see the journey that he's come on because I don't know that a lot of people would have predicted he would be a, a future Hall of Famer, future best shooter of all time, right. up for discussion in terms of best players of all time. What was your answer when they asked you that? Same, very similar. That you know, like it, like when he was drafted, and especially early in his career, it was damn near impossible to uh, foreshadow like the greatness that was to come. Right. I mean, he was sharing a backcourt with Monte Ellis early on, and, and a lot of people True. thought Monte was a better player. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the ankle. You know, we, we were re revisiting the ankle injuries and and how serious yeah. that was. I mean, That's true. I mean, and and one of the more interesting things I thought was just uh, remembering the fact that. If you were a member of Dub Nation, if you're a Warriors fan, you were so jaded and you were so pessimistic that mm. you couldn't like rest your hopes on a player like Stephen Curry because the, and and I remember specifically the ankle injuries was like my scapegoat for great like even though like this kid has talent he looks special it's never going to work out a because he's he's part of the Golden State Warriors and the only thing that happens to the Warriors are bad things. And B, these ankles are are what's going to drive him down. He, we're never going to see like a full season from him, and so so to see him grow and to battle through all that and to turn into the player he is is incredible. We could talk a lot more about that if you want. Um, but can yeah, I, I'm gonna, can I flip a question back at you? Because Please. I it, the thing is, I wasn't a Warriors fan at that time. I moved to the Bay Area three and a half years ago. Um, knew of the Golden State Warriors, watched them in their especially championship runs over the last decade, but still wasn't a diehard fan at that point. What was the feeling among Stub Nation, not only when Steph was drafted, but like when Draymond Green and Clay Thompson were brought in, like were people actually excited or was that frustration still carrying over? Like, I feel like those couple of years were such an interesting like transition time. What was it like as a fan? A very skeptical and pessimistic skeptical. simply because the Warriors mm -hmm. were so awful at drafting. Um, yeah. There was no way anyone could have seen Draymond Green turning into uh, what he turned. Like, for example, That's what the I was also thinking, too, when we're talking about Steph, I was immediately thinking Draymond kind of in the same boat right after him. Yeah, like, exactly. And, and the Draymond. Turn into this? Absolutely. Yeah. And the Draymond thing was fascinating only because I feel like his emergence was like the final piece to this mm -hmm. whole puzzle. Like we were, we were revisiting 2015 and how David Lee was the starting power forward. And. It was only because of David Lee's injury that Draymond Green even got the opportunity to to step in and take over. Um, and it was it's just crazy to go back and think about it because I don't think any of us do that enough. And this yeah. Warriors franchise's history is just it's rich when you look at the last ten plus years, even fifteen leading up into it. Um, I don't know. It was it was really cool, but uh, yeah. So what was your perspective on it, like as a as a non Warriors fan, like? How long did it take you to realize that, there, that this was a special unit? Because, again, for me, it wasn't until they won the championship. Yep. And part well, of that was just the feeling of, of being a Warriors fan. Like, good things do not happen to us who love the Warriors. So it, it took winning the championship to finally start being optimistic. But as a non-Warriors fan, what was your perspective? Like, how long did it take you to realize this was something special? I didn't think twice about the Warriors uh, until they won that championship. I mean, right. he drank his, his, and I grew up in the Chicago area. For those who don't know, background, grew up a diehard Bulls fan, you know, followed teams on the West Coast. But the Golden State Warriors during that time period, even into the early 2010s, like weren't a team that was on other teams radars. I feel like until that championship really made right. a statement, even when they got better after those draft picks started to emerge, it still I don't, I, I think even across the league, they weren't necessarily taken seriously until they won that championship. That is when they really got on the map for me, yeah, at, at least absolutely. during this current, you know, during the most recent memory of Warriors basketball. Like to me, that was when they got on the map, you know, across the league to where they were viewed as now, Hey, this could be a special team. Um, even after that first championship though, I still would not have predicted they would win four and eight seasons. That still, like, I still didn't see that potential in the team. But I think at that point, then they were on the map and, and you know, teams were taking them seriously and seeing them as being championship contenders. Because even leading up to that, because of the history, um, you know, and the disappointments, I don't even think when Steph, Dre, and Clay started to emerge, other teams necessarily believed that they were as talented and had the potential they had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just, and real quick, uh, Chris Swish here, I, I totally agree. And I actually highlighted that point in the documentary yeah. that, yeah, you didn't sense a shift in the culture, and, and and you didn't sense greatness from this group until Mark Jackson became the head coach. Because what I said in this documentary, and I'll say here, 
the Mark Jackson was represented the first time in my entire life and in nearly 40 years of Warriors basketball where they actually played defense it, through all these decades, 80s, 90s, 2000s, or early 2010s. The Warriors had no understanding of how to play defense. And Mark Jackson brought that intensity and that that discipline. And that, to me, is where it all started really turning around. I, I don't think Mark Jackson gets enough credit for what he, he did to this culture in, in terms of what he brought out of the core three because he he tapped into their their potential and brought out as as Chris and others have mentioned their confidence that that killer instinct um and mercy me mercy me writes and we'll answer this when we come back do you see Steph winning another championship and, and another finals MVP Kyle and I'll ask you that as well uh when we come back got to give some love to fan duel the official sports book of the locked on podcast network uh, let me get the graphic, actually. I forgot to do the last time. There we go. Uh, oh, I still got a comment here that's hiding. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. It's complicated running a live show sometimes. All right, so take your first swing at betting on Major League Baseball with FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets, up to $200, actually. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose, that's 200 You can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to, the, to to hit the first home run. And even though this copy is all about Major League Baseball, Kylan, the Women's World Cup is going on right now. You can bet on that as well. And I figured this is a good time to ask you, how is the women's team doing? Can you give us an update on that? Yeah, a little bit of a disappointing showing for the U.S. women's national team in their last Sorry, match right, against yeah, the Netherlands on Wednesday night. Uh, they ended up uh, getting a 1-1 draw against Netherlands, but they went down. Uh, they looked terrible in the first half, to be frank. Really sloppy, disorganized, flat, uh, not a lot of energy. It was definitely not a good first 45. They bounced back, especially late in the game, showed a lot of urgency, uh, started really pressing and creating goal scoring chances. But it was a bit of a flat performance. The Vietnam game to open the World Cup for the U.S., also not their strongest performance. Hmm. I mean, they were clear, clear, clear favorites. Uh, Vietnam playing in their first World Cup, never won a World Cup match, obviously, since they'd never played. Uh, the U.S. coming in ranked first in the world. They beat them 3-0, but they took 28 shots. 28 to zero. So they should have scored more goals. Uh, so they just weren't effective in the final third. That was a little bit concerning in that first match. In the second matchup, they come out with a draw in a game that should have been very winnable. So it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. USA faces Portugal uh, coming up on August 1st, midnight. So if you want to put some bets in now, I would put my money on the US. I would after watching Portugal. Uh, they fell to the Netherlands and they looked a little bit flat in that game as well. So I think USA is the better team, but they're going to have to step up if they want to move on and advance through the knockout rounds. But money on USA for the August 1st matchup. All right, there you go. And that's the next next matchup for, for the yeah, US so that's teams, the that next. Correct? Yep, that's the next matchup. Like I said, our time on the Pacific, uh, Pacific time on the West Coast, it's going to be at midnight. So it actually will be like Tuesday, August 1st going into Wednesday. All right. And uh, follow Kylan Mills on all social media platforms uh, to get updates on the World Cup and more specifically the U.S. team and how they're doing. Um, you cover the earthquakes. You cover soccer. You played soccer in college. Follow Kylan on social media platforms at Kylan Mills. And uh, just to finish up the read here, there's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball on the World Cup, whatever your sport is, then FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. For the everydayers, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Locked On Dubs. This is where we announce Showtimes, who's coming up next as a guest. We've got a Warriors assistant coach coming on the show. We're just waiting for uh, the time and the day that they're going to be available, and I'm excited for that to happen uh, as well. So make sure you follow us there to find all that information out. Make sure you follow Kylan Mills on all social media platforms, including Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Kylan Mills. You can follow me on threads at dog wild and on twitter at dog surf roadshow um so 
The question Mercy asked, and we'll address this now. We see everything else in the chat. We'll get to all of it. Don't worry. Uh, do you see Steph winning another championship? Kylan, your thoughts on that? Oh, Cyrus, this is such a hard one to answer because we've been talking about specifically this upcoming season squad and feeling like there needs to be one or two more pieces added. Uh, I think Dario Saric was a great addition, but I just... I don't feel real strongly about saying they're going to win it this season. Uh, I just, it's a hard question to answer right now. Like the thing is going into last season, I would have said yes, because they were looking to run it back after winning a championship. Um, you know, the off season moves. I, I, I honestly didn't expect the Warriors to struggle last season as much as they did with the same best or top six players as the one, the championship just one season before. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that put a little bit of that planted a seed of doubt in my mind a little bit in terms of how important the role players are around those six, whether or not age is catching up with the core. Uh, so it's a hard one for me to answer. I would like to say, yes, uh, Steph is one of the greatest players of all time. They did keep this core intact. Um, you know, the starters, as we talked about the most efficient in terms of offensive numbers, when they were able to play together last season, can they get more out of them? Did they add enough depth this season? I just am very, I don't feel confident yet about how this group and the makeup of this season's roster is going to shake out. Is the Chris Paul thing going to work? Could he butt heads with anyone? Is he going to step in and embrace a second unit role? There just still are so many questions about this season for me uh, that make that one a tough one to answer. I'd like to say yes, though. I think Steph deserves another title. Um, the core, I think the core three deserve another title, uh, but I just, I don't know, man. What do you think? I, I here's my, my prediction, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I feel confident about this. Is, and mm -hmm. I don't know how happy you'll be here in this or how satisfactory of an answer this is. But to me, this Warriors team this year is going to be one of two teams. It's either going to be the 2013 Lakers, where they're old, and yeah, the Chris Paul trade was just like bringing in Steve Nash. I mean, the, we mm -hmm. can't forget he's 38. I mean, that's you know, it's I, yeah. I don't see 38 year olds not named LeBron James making a huge impact. And you're um, adding an old player to an old team. You know what I yes. mean? Like that's where I said if, if Chris Paul were to start and they went small, like the Warriors would by far be the oldest starting five in the league. Like that's not necessarily, that's not usually viewed as a good thing. Like, yes. And by far the smallest one team. Thing. Yeah. They'd yeah. be smallest and oldest. Which is <laughs> Old and small. combination. <laughs> but like, I yeah. don't know. Adding old. a 38 year old to already a core that's all in their mid 30s. I, I don't know. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> But the but the other side of the coin is, uh, you know, they could also end up being like the 2013 Spurs, where the, the young talent, more specifically like Kaminga, uh, Moses Moody. You also there's also a lot of players on this team we don't we haven't really like focused heavily on, like the Andrew Wiggins of the world, the Gary Payton seconds of the world. Like if, you know, if they have like monster years, um, if Trace Jackson Davis ends up being the player that we imagine, if he can make an impact in his rookie season. Who knows? But, uh, you know, yeah. to me, it's going to be one of two directions. A lot of it is going to come down to Kaminga. I would feel a lot better, similar to you, if they use that 14th roster spot, yeah. not on Lester Quinones, who seems to be the favorite for that, um, but rather on a big, like on a JaVale McGee, if he becomes available yes, in the buyout market. I would love that. Same. So, um, so it's still not it's still not over yet. But but the, the, the more interesting thing to me with that question uh, about Stephen Curry winning a fifth title and his second finals MVP is this is why I'm so passionate. I love Stephen Curry. I think as a human being, he's, he's just an, an amazing person. Like he's yeah. altruistic. Uh, he's very family oriented. Obviously his energy is super fun. Um, the amount of energy he has alone is incredible and is contagious. And he's just a good dude. He, he makes, he makes it very easy to root for him. And I want Stephen Curry to win a fifth title simply because to me, the difference between four and five is so profound for his legacy. Like if he wins a fifth title, you can argue he's on Mount Rushmore, you know, like now who else is on that on the Mount Rushmore? There's only four players you could throw on there, right? I mean, Michael Jordan, I think is a foregone conclusion. Most people would say LeBron James, you know, tough arguing against that. And the other two are up in the air. I mean, who's the center? Is it Kareem? Is it Wilt? Is it Bill Russell? Um, you probably want to put one of those uh, players on there. And then to me, the fourth, yeah. if Steph wins that fifth title, he's on there. He's the best point guard of all time. He revolutionized this entire sport. He's the greatest shooter ever. He's one of the best ball handlers ever. Side note, by the way, the ball handling thing is fascinating as well because that's one piece of, uh, of his game that has grown so much from when he was a rookie to now. Like no one was talking about Stephen Curry 
as an all-time great ball handler early in his career. You could yeah. easily say that now. So that, that's he's just a phenomenal human being. And I, I do root for him winning that fifth title because I know mm -hmm. how much it means. So yeah, that's my same. personal opinion on it. But I don't know. Any, any last thoughts, Kylan, on that before we move on from, uh, from Steph? No, I agree. How do you not root for Stephen Curry? Like he has to be one of the most likable players in the NBA. I'm convinced. Um, and for all the reasons that you mentioned, in addition to revolutionizing the game, uh, you know, all the things he does off the court, the person that he is, the energy that he brings, the selflessness that he brings to the Warriors, uh, you know, the causes, the charities. He does so much work in the community outside of the Warriors. I just feel like, how do you not like Steph? I, I don't yeah. know. I know there's people, there's got to be someone out there that doesn't like him. But even before I moved to the Bay and, you know, became a part of what is Dub Nation, I lo love Steph Curry. I mean, I just, even around the league, I just don't think he's a hateable guy. Uh, so certainly I'm rooting for him to win that fifth championship. I think, like you said, it would mean a lot to his legacy. Uh, but I just also feel like he's one of the most likable players in the NBA. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, and Bruce Morrow, by the way, bring it up uh, how he's also one of the greatest uh, spicy chicken eaters. I haven't seen that episode yet. Have you of a uh, of what is that show called? That's um, Hot Ones. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, I haven't seen it. But I know. Yeah, so Stephen Curry. I'm gonna watch. That's on my. I'm gonna watch it today. I was I was gonna watch it last night and I fell asleep on the couch. But um, but yeah, Stephen Curry was a guest on Hot Ones, which is. Mm -hmm. uh, First of all, the interviewer on that show, I forgot his name. He's, he does a fantastic job. Like, it's not that easy. It may look easy, but it's not in terms of conducting yeah. an interview where you're extrapolating great answers from your guests. Like, that's not an easy thing to pull off. And and the host mm -hmm. of that show does, a, I think, a tremendous job doing so. Um, so, yeah, but the clips are up online. Uh, you know, Steph's eating, the, you know, these, these these incredibly spicy sauces on the wings um and ken mama brings up i saw this clip on social media as well that steph is eating all these spicy wings and not drinking anything um like i didn't see him see drink milk once but i haven't watched the whole episode i, was, I wasn't gonna really build on that but uh but ken mama's writing he never drank milk that's incredible Crazy. um let's stay on the steph topic uh I, we were teasing these other clips we'll get to that in a second but well before we move on to completely uh i've been wanting to play this clip for nearly a week now and this is steph and curry um, talking about who his all-time starting five is. This was about a week ago that he uh, answered this question. I think it was for BuzzFeed, and, and he's got, if you're watching this on YouTube, he's got puppies uh, in the mix with him while he's answering this. <laughs> Anyways, here's Stephen Curry answering who his starting five all-time is, and these are non-active players. Past or present? NBA players, I would pick Shaquille O'Neal as my center, Tim Duncan as my power forward, Larry Bird is my small forward. Am I on the team? Ha! Huh. Michael Jordan is my shooting guard. Late addition. I'm not taking. I'm not taking Larry. I'm taking Kobe as my small forward. Jordan at my shooting guard. And Magic Johnson at point guard. I won't. I'll, I won't be on the team. Yeah, so he went with a he went with a non-active players and put himself on the team. Were you supp what, any surprises on his list? I thought Shaq was a surprise. Uh, any shockers to you? Uh, no talk? huge shockers. I mean, those guys are all I feel like in the league of being in discussions of all-time starting fives. Uh, Larry got the boot though. I did think that was kind of funny. Larry Bird certainly yes, would be did. up there in the discussion. Uh, Shaq maybe you know on the fence, but, uh, I know Steph has a good relationship with Shaq. So I guess that also doesn't surprise me. Maybe he got a little edge, uh, because of that. Yes. Yes. Shaq is a definite, uh, uh, uh Steph propagandist on inside the NBA. And I do love yeah. that. No complaints there. <laughs> yeah. Um, good, good pushback for his colleague, Charles Barkley. Uh, let's, let's seg into that. That's a good transition. Well, that's um, what I know. I was going to say perfect timing when we're talking about inside the NBA, uh, <laughs> and, and we'll inside the NBA, not, uh, Warriors propagandist, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll get to some of the chat questions I'm saving for the end of the show, so stay tuned for that. If you feel like we're ignoring you, we're not. Um, but uh, Charles Barkley was at the same, uh, what is it, the Accenture Championship, something. It's, it's, the, it's the annual celebrity golf tournament they have in Lake Tahoe. Uh, yeah. Speaking of Steph, I mean, in, in, in transitions, I mean, uh, Steph won the damn thing. I mean, I think I believe he was the first basketball player ever to do so. Yeah. Um, had a hole in one in the tournament. I mean, that alone. Do you have any thoughts on that? We haven't touched on that at all. It's golf, but Steph won the tournament. That's 
That's no easy feat. I mean, the, the other people in this tournament were trying to win, folks. And Steph won the damn thing. He's a scratch golfer. He's actually better than a scratch golfer. Um, more, yeah, any thoughts on that, Kylan? It was insane. It's not fair for someone to be that good at two sports, but the American Century, I think it's called, I can't remember, tournament or whatever the hell they call it. Um, it's a huge event, like huge. They've been having it in Tahoe for years. They attract big name celebrities, high caliber athletes from every sport all over the country, even the world. So for Steph to win, like he was among elite company. Now I'm not saying he was, obviously these are all amateurs, but still these are all great athletes. Uh, it's been no secret for a while that Steph Curry loves golf, but like he's been working on his game apparently because there are a lot of really, really talented athletes that take part in this and it's a huge event. So yep. I was a little bit surprised to see him win. Not hugely surprised because we know Steph Curry likes to golf, uh, but it was really cool to see. That hole-in-one video is insane. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's floating around on Twitter, uh, you know, somewhere on the internet. But it's just not fair. Why is he so good at multiple sports? Watch Steph go and be on the PGA Tour after he retires. Like, I, I wouldn't even be shocked by that at this point. It's incredible. It, it goes to show just how amazing of an individual he is. Uh, thank you to AC in the chat for uh, for the slight correction. Steph was the first active mm. uh, NBA player to win the tournament. Vinny Del Negro actually won it some years back. Uh, Bruce Morrow mentioning someone was yelling at Marty Fish swinging on the 18th. That's true. That's really messed up. I hope they ejected the, yeah. the spectator who did that. Very poor form. Uh, that is not proper golf fan etiquette. Um but nonetheless, um, so Steph wins this thing. His, his the hole in one he made, by the way, was his second in his life. That's how incredible of an individual he is. How talented Stephen Curry is. He has two career hole in ones. That's, That's ridiculous. Mind boggling. Like one is mind boggling. He has two. So that he hit his second one at the tournament. But here is Charles Barkley, who had some interesting comments about Jordan Poole. I have no idea how facetious he was, how serious he was, but his he did. Express opinions. Here's what Barkley had to say. Yeah, they hated Jordan Poole. They really hated Jordan Poole. That's the number one thing I said to myself. They really hated Jordan Poole. <laughs> because they moved him like that? Yeah, they did move him like that. You know what? This is going to be a chance for him to reset. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a tough year. He was uh, peaks and valleys. So he needed a fresh start. So I hope it works out. Yeah, they hated I think when, they, when Barkley is saying they, he's referring specifically to Draymond Green. Um, I don't know if the entire team hates him. Very strong words, and that was courtesy of, of Monty Poole, no relation to Jordan, on NBC Sports Bay Area with that clip. Kylan, your thoughts. Do, do the Warriors hate Jordan Poole? I don't think that's true. Um, I think there was certainly some frustration from top to bottom of the organization with his play, the late game execution, shot selection, turnovers, certainly many of the basketball things that we talked about. Uh, but like we saw Steph Curry posted a nice tribute to Jordan Poole on his Instagram account when, you know, the news was made official uh, that Jordan was moving on, uh, you know, and Steph talked about how difficult it is to watch a young player who you've helped mentor, who you've become close with move on and have to take those next steps, even if it is necessary uh, with another team. Um, so I don't think the Warriors as a whole hate Jordan Poole, uh, even throughout the season, despite struggles, Bob Myers, Steve Kerr, they always talked uh, very highly about Jordan. Um, I think that basketball-wise, maybe it didn't fit. They felt like, you know, he didn't live up to that contract that he was given and, and you know, wasn't able to run the second unit the way they wanted him to run. And at the end of the day, these are business decisions. Um, the front office has to do what's going to be the best business-wise for the organization. Um, but, you know... Steph was pretty vocal in that, you know, he had a close relationship with Jordan. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I didn't see anyone else on the team having issues with him outside of Draymond Green. Like, I think, like you said, Draymond Green did not like Jordan Poole at all. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like the Warriors as an organization as a whole didn't have any issue with Jordan Poole, the person. They didn't hate Jordan Poole, the person, but maybe just, you know, the contract that was given, the basketball that was delivered just didn't match up. And they felt like they needed to bring in a different piece to, you know, try to help bridge the gap in the second unit. Absolutely. Um, it's, yeah, I would agree with you. I don't think most of the people hate. Hate's a strong word. Um, yeah. Now, clearly, Draymond Green and Jordan Poole are not getting along. I, I'm very curious. I, I look until. All this happened. I had never in my life had any interest in seeing the Warriors play the Wizards. 
that is now a marquee matchup. Yeah. I, I I don't even know what the date is on that matchup. Yeah. Maybe some of the chat can can bring that up of when the Warriors and Wizards play. You better believe there's going to be a lot of focus on that. As members of the media, Kylan, I'm very curious. I know exactly where in Chase Center that family room is, where <laughs> all the players' family hangs out uh, before and after the games, which Draymond alluded, alluded to in regard to Jordan Poole's father and how they're going to cross paths there. You better believe there's going to be a lot of focus on that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm excited about Warriors Wizards um, whenever that game is next season. Um, yeah, so there's Charles Barkley being typical Charles Charles Barkley. Uh, I mean, he's what, a known Warriors hater, so you got to take what he says with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, I love personally the banter. Like, he tries to incite Dub Nation. I find it entertaining. I think in general he's entertaining on Inside the NBA. What he says may not be completely true, uh, but he throws his takes out there. Uh, and like I said, I always find him to be entertaining. I, I think it's funny uh, the way that he hates on the Warriors personally. Like, <laughs> doesn't get my, you know, doesn't bother me. I don't lose any sleep over it. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> I think it, it does. It does uh, 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 bother, I think, the Bay Area and members. of it, it did bother a lot of folks until the Warriors won a title. Um, and, and the fact that the Warriors kept winning titles, because even after the Warriors won the first one, even after the one, I think the second one, third one, Barkley was just always doubting him. He was always hating on him. And, and yes, it is partly a running bit. Um, you know, but so there you go. Uh, yeah. one last soundbite to, to wrap up the show. Um, this is still focused on Draymond Green, but, uh, the, the antagonist, the, the antithesis to Draymond in this situation, um, is not Jordan Poole, but it's rather Anthony Edwards, um, a player uh, on the on the Minnesota Timberwolves, former number one pick, a player, side note, that the Warriors could have gotten, by the way, uh, instead of uh, settling for the number two pick with James Wiseman. The Timberwolves were shopping that pick. Early speculation was they wanted Kaminga back if, if for a pick swap. Uh, but who knows how far that went? Who knows if the Warriors could have pulled that trade off without including Kaminga in it? Um, but Whatever, that's a side note. Uh, Anthony Edwards is now with the Timberwolves, but he was asked who he would prefer to play in the playoffs. Um, and his answer was interesting. Here's Anthony Edwards. What, you, uh, what are you looking forward to most of this upcoming season? Definitely going back to the playoffs and going further in the playoffs to go versus uh, the Warriors. I want to play the Warriors. I want to get to the Warriors. Wherever they at, I want to get to them. Exactly. Why the Warriors so much? Because I mean, because Draymond talks so much trash. That's pretty much the only reason. There you go. Draymond talks a trash, uh, and Anthony Edwards wants to play the Warriors. I, I do appreciate the respect he gave him. He is assuming that the Warriors will be available later in the playoffs for the Timberwolves to, to play them. Um, Kylan, what are your thoughts on the fact that Anthony Edwards wants all the smoke with Dre? Uh, not a huge surprise to me. I mean, Draymond Green seems to bring that out of players across the NBA, and he does talk that trash. He knows it, and he might get under some people's skin. He might put a target on his back because of it, but he's not afraid. Uh, you know, Draymond Green is someone who welcomes the trash talk back, who welcomes the physicality, who welcomes the competition. So uh, I would love to see that matchup. I think it would be fun to watch. I also feel like in general, though, there is a target on the Warriors' backs after you win four championships in eight seasons. Beyond just Draymond Green, like, we saw it all season last year. Teams get up for playing the Warriors. They consider it a feather in their cap to beat the Warriors, even in regular season games. They're throwing the best they have at Golden State because the Warriors are now the team to beat when you dominate the way they have in the last decade. So to me, they've got to expect that from teams across the NBA. Uh, and, you know, Draymond Green being on the Warriors certainly adds a little bit of extra motivation uh, for some of the individual players who have been listening to his trash talk like Anthony Edwards. So <laughs> not a huge surprise, but I think the Warriors have to expect it. I think going into the season, they have to expect it. I feel like they went out against some teams and got hit in the mouth last year. Teams came out absolutely throwing the kitchen sink at them and, and giving all that they had. And the Warriors didn't look quite prepared and they looked asleep at times to start games. Uh, I think the Warriors have to change that mentality and they have to expect that teams are hunting them. Anthony Edwards of the world are hunting them. You know, players around the league notice they want to beat the Warriors. There's an extra motivation to beat the Warriors and the team has to be ready. Absolutely. I'm with you. Um, I, I will say this, and, and uh, to end the Warriors discussion on a positive note, I think this Warriors team is vastly superior to what they were a year ago. Um, they're deeper than they were a year ago. I'm yeah, hoping I think they're better. 
Yeah, and and I, and I'm hoping that that Steve Kerr um, is more aware of his mishandling of Kaminga and Moody, uh, and they have to play. I mean, they, they have to be part of this. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a reason to be optimistic there, but I'm with you. They're still a small team. They're an old team. I, I would feel good if they added JaVale McGee in that 14th roster spot. Like, that would definitely give me a little boost, uh, you know, in terms of my confidence. I, I think his size could be a huge addition. Uh, experience, comfortability is all there. Like, I... I think that would be a great addition. I'm curious to see what they do with that 14th roster spot because I do think they've got to get a big body in there. Agreed. Totally agree. Um, getting to the chat, wrapping things up, uh, some of what uh, some of what was written um, earlier in the show. Uh, Femi Bamadel, I hope I pronounced that correctly, writes, um, and this goes for both of us, Kylan. Uh, sorry that they did not include you in this. Uh, in your opinion, okay. what's the likelihood Kerr forces the front office to bring Anthony Lamb back? on a two-way contract, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I don't. I don't have much to base that off of other than we haven't heard any speculation. Uh, they tried that last year. It wasn't very effective. Um, it would shock me if Anthony Lamb comes back. What are your thoughts, Kylan? I will also be shocked if Anthony Lamb comes back. Like They have so many better options <clears throat> in terms of two-way contract players, players assigned to the 14th or 15th spots. Uh, clearly, Steve Kerr had something, uh, a weird we've talked about it, aversion or, or the opposite of aversion. Uh, he loved Anthony Lamb for whatever reason. I don't think we'll see him back. I, I don't think that Steve Kerr will be able to pull the purse strings that much to, to make it happen. I really don't. They have better options out there. I just don't see that happening. I, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, and Femi also brought up something that uh, people have been curious about for years, which is uh, why Mark Jackson despite doing a phenomenal job with the Golden State Warriors those two years, why he's never been given another opportunity. Um, the best way I, could, I can answer this, if you do your research on, on the internet, and there's a lot of information out there, um, Mark Jackson was a rather religious individual and sometimes was pushing those religious beliefs maybe a little too strongly behind the scenes when it comes to players uh, organizationally. Um, he, he was saying and doing things that in a corporate environment, uh, which is what the NBA is, doesn't fly. Um, I, I, I'm trying to answer this in the best way possible without ruffling a lot of feathers or being too graphic and also while, while maintaining factual accuracy. Um, Kylan, what, it, based on what you know, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think it's a good question to ask because, I mean, the Warriors do need to credit Mark Jackson for a lot of the success the team has right now. Um, and it was interesting because earlier when you brought up Mark Jackson, we were talking about the early years. I was just kind of thinking like, man, and it's, and I've heard people say this before, but you know, like Steve Kerr inherited a team that was already great. Mark Jackson did a lot of that base work in, in Absolutely. developing the core three when they were still young players. Like he, to me, did the gritty work uh, in terms of coaching. So it, it's a good question as far as why I think that you said it, Cy, but um it is interesting that I just feel like he has never really fully gotten the credit he deserves. Like, I feel like, I don't know, Cy, like is Mark Jackson, like heralded within the Warriors organization? Like, I don't know, but I feel like I've heard Steph say it maybe, but like, yeah. I feel like he should come up more in conversation when talking about the dynasty in the last decade. I don't know. I totally agree with you. I, if you ask the players, they'll give Mark Jackson uh, I think the respect that he deserves, and more specifically, if you ask Steph, Mark, uh, yeah, Steph's brought it up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but again, the, I, the best player who has talked about this publicly, who was on those teams, is Andrew Bogut. If you want mm -hmm. the answer as to why Mark Jackson uh, has not ever been hired for another coaching job, read what Mark Andrew Bogut has said about Mark Jackson, and and I think that might uh, provide you the answer that you're looking for. Um, we're uh, we're running late here. Drew real, real quickly real quickly asks. Turn on super chat. Um, Locked on owns the channel. Uh, I, I don't think I have the ability. I'll bring it up with them to see if I can. I don't even know what super chat is. Do you know what that is, Kylan? No, I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't even know either. Uh, Ken Mamba real, real quickly asked, do you see Steph playing for another team in the future? I say no. Your thoughts, Kylan? Nope. 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 Yeah, nope. I All right, we got to go. <laughs> yeah, we got to wrap <laughs> it up. 40 yeah. minute All right. limit. <laughs> I'm out of there. Uh, okay, so have a great weekend, everyone. Um, we'll be back at this soon. Follow us on Twitter and all our social media platforms. Have a great weekend, folks. Stay cool out there. Go Team USA. Go Stephen Curry. Kylan, love you. Bye, everyone. 
Later. <laughs> Thanks, hi. <laughs> Absolutely.